This is Barry, and welcome to Simplicity Zone. Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, if you could take a moment and click like and subscribe, I appreciate it. It helps uh, distribute this podcast to a wider audience. If you're watching this on one of the podcast apps out there, um, you can always go to simplicityzen.com and sign up for the newsletter. Today, my guest is Jinryo Jones Osho, who is the head instructor at Iron City Rinzai in Pittsburgh. He practiced Renzai Zen in Japan under legendary Zen master Shoto Harada Roshi, under whom he's ordained as a Zen priest. He's currently studying under American Zen teacher Meido Moore Roshi, who's abbot of Korinji in Wisconsin. How are you doing today, General? Great. General? Good to see you, Barry. Thanks for having me on. It's, it's yeah, Gen, Gen, Genryo, though. Genryo. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think it would be a uh, Simplicity Zen podcast if I didn't misspell a couple of important words. I mean, mispronounce a couple of important words. It's, uh, it's kind of like a learning disability to me. I, I struggle with it. Um, so just kind of diving in, could you tell us a little bit about your background, uh, like where you grew up, kind sure. of family situation and so forth? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I grew up in Southwest Missouri, in Springfield, Missouri. Um, my, uh, my dad was a postal carrier. He was a mailman. My, my mom was a stay-at-home mom till I was in sixth grade, and then she became a, a library clerk. Um, let's see. We, was, this family, rural? Huh? was this a rural area? Yeah, rural Missouri. We're just north of the Ozarks. Springfield's like the first big town north of the Ozark Mountains. And uh, yeah, my family has been there forever, uh, for a long time. My uh, six generations in Greene County. One of my dad's favorite jokes was we had this painting of my fifth great back grandfather on the wall. And one time when I was in college, one of my, my girlfriend's roommate was Swiss and she came to visit us. And uh, my dad was like, that there is Bradley's great, 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 great grandfather. And he came over from the old country. And she was like, oh, the old country, which, which country is that? And he said, Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> and that was... <laughs> Was he being funny, uh, ironic, uh, he, like inadvertently funny, or was he trying to say a joke? No, he was saying a joke, but it's true. But yeah, long time there. And uh, uh, yeah, so my family was not particularly religious at all. Um, I think we, we lived in the city till I was like five, and then we moved out to the countryside about 10 miles outside of, outside of Springfield. And mm -hmm. when we were in the city, I remember we went to some kind of Presbyterian or Methodist church that was a few blocks away. Uh, vague memories of that but then not not after we moved i sort of you know remember my dad like making fun of televangelists on tv but that was the only and only religion i remember but but i uh, i went to sunday school there was a southwest baptist sunday school uh, that all my friends went to so i went to sunday school and, and vacation bible school and and bible camps and all that and i was really into it when i was a kid um enough so that you know, I got, I was really concerned about going to hell. I was really like worried. And I remember um, when I was about probably sixth or seventh grades, I was uh, visiting my, my grandparents' house down on, on Lake Taney Como. And I remember just telling myself that there is no hell. I like managed to convince myself that hell was not real. And I remember just feeling a, a release of tension in my belly, just like, ah. But then I kind of knew I was sort of lying to myself that it was a mental trick. So I was really, I was really concerned about it. Um, and I also was, I was really into uh, Knights and Robin Hood. Robin Hood was my, my main thing. I remember uh, uh, there's a Robin Hood book by Bernard Miles that, that I checked out of the library like 12 times till my mom bought it for me. Um, and I, I remember, you know, walking in the woods behind my parents' house pretending I was Robin Hood and uh, there were a lot of rabbits and I would, I would track rabbits in the woods, just like seeing how quietly I could walk in the woods pretending to be Robin Hood. And, and uh, that's a really strong memory. I think that was sort of like the first inkling of Samadhi I ever really remembered was just like being quiet in the woods, following rabbits around. Um, and so, yeah, that, uh, that archetype of like the, the valiant, heroic uh, protector was just really strong for me um, because I was such a timid, shy kid. I was, you know, that, that was the, everything that I wasn't. That was what I admired in those, in those stories. Um, um, How about the wizards and the magic part? 
Uh, yeah, not so much really. No, I remember I was like crusaders, like protecting the pilgrims. I, was, I thought that was cool. And Robin Hood, you know, robbing from the rich. Um, maybe later, much later when I got into D and D, yeah, that that became bigger. But uh, yeah, not, I'm talking like grade grade school stuff here. Um, you spend a lot of time in the woods playing. Yeah, yeah. Just, well, I mean, we lived on like 15 acres, and just you could just go and just play in the woods. I spent a lot of time in the woods then. Um, so let's see. Oh, oh, then yeah, the the story I, I told before um, was uh, I was I was so concerned about being a good Christian, and and I then I started to get disillusioned with Christianity. And one one episode that stands out was I was at Sunday school, and I I asked the Sunday school teacher, and I you know I feel bad relating it now because he was just somebody's dad, you know, meaning to do good. He wasn't like a theologian or anything, but I asked him like it had occurred to me there was the story of Adam and Eve and they had Cain and Abel were their sons, first humans, but then Cain and Abel got married. So I, you know, I asked, where did these women come from that Cain and Abel married? And Eddie just like, good Christians don't ask questions like that. He said that really. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, I was like sixth or seventh grade. Um, and I remember just being like, what? <laughs> um, so stuff like that. And just sort of, hypocrisy and you know i got disillusioned with with that um and uh and also you know i guess i was hitting hitting puberty and just sort of the the ugliness of the world was sort of dawning on me and uh and in reaction to that i uh, you know i i found punk rock that was my the next big chapter in my life like about ninth grade or so through a friend of my big brothers how old are you how old am I now? Yeah. I'm um, 49. I'll be 50 in October. Okay. So yeah, we're, we're pretty much almost exactly the same age. Um, so, so what the bands have been like black flag and dead Kennedy. And, and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. We were, I mean, this was like 86, 87 in rural Missouri. So we were kind of like five years behind the coasts. So yeah, <laughs> we were pretty much early eighties, but yeah, no, I, I got the, all, all that stuff. And, and, uh, but we got some new stuff. I mean, I remember when the first Gorilla Biscuits CD came out. It was like the first CD I ever got. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it was just such a important time for me. You know, we the scene in Springfield was very. I mean, Springfield is very oppressive, um, very conservative. It's like the buckle of the Bible Belt. Mm -hmm. um, so the Alternative Kids were really like a, a very tight knit um, family. Um, there was a a square. Springfield is one of the one of the last you know those last small towns with a big town square that was completely dead. So no, all the punks would go there and just hang out on the town square. Um, and we, uh, I actually was doing uh, I was doing small press comics um, with a friend of mine in junior high, and uh, we we had our comics out for like twenty five cents for a mini comic at the record store. And uh, this guy uh, Frank Bazinki was uh, started. He was putting on a show. He got uh, that was the first show I ever saw. It was Dead Silence. Was a a, a vegan punk band from San Francisco. Um, and he contacted me through the mini comics and wanted me to help him with flyers. So that was how I, that was like my end to the scene. And so I, I helped him, you know, make and put up flyers. And I still remember like riding around, he had this like gigantic Buick or something. We we're riding around putting on, putting up flyers. And he was just like honking at every car that came anywhere near him. And he was like, it's my responsibility to use my horn to communicate with other drivers. But it was, I don't know, it was just really fun. Um, what what um what what was the appeal of punk to you um at that point it was just it was so raw and real and visceral and and like i said there was this close there's belonging to the scene this family feeling um among the scene um and then a little later you know i got after a year or two, I, I discovered Straight Edge, and that was, you know, minor. Like, yeah, exactly, minor threat. I said, I went, I went, went to Camelot Music with my mom in the mall and got the cassette and the big plastic thing, so you couldn't shoplift it. Mm -hmm. And we went to the grocery store. While she went to the grocery store, I sat in her in her car and blasted Minor Threat, and it was just like religious experience. <laughs> so, so good. 
so amazing. Um, and yeah, like I said, it, uh, it just like the Robin hood, the crusaders, the knights, the, it just fit with that. Um, and it made perfect sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, did you shave your head? Um, not at that point. Um, some, some of my friends were skinheads, but they were, you know, this was, they were the anti-racist skinheads, of course. Right. Yeah. Um, which most are historically. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Both and, uh, that were kind of the Nazi. Yeah. That, especially at that time in, in that, in our town, but, uh, there, it was a serious thing. You could, I mean, I remember a guy getting, I mean, this was back in the days when you had to mail order Doc Martens from England and you just hoped they fit. And if they didn't fit, you wore them anyway, you couldn't just get them at the mall. And, and if, you know, if the kids thought you weren't tough enough to wear them, they would beat you up and take them away. <laughs> so, um, no, I was just a skater kid. Um, but we, you know, we, me, you know, there was about half a dozen of us or so that we played in bands and we, we booked out of town bands to come. We put up flyers, we rented the BFW hall. I mean, we did the whole scene for like, for about three years, we did a, about a show a month. Um, <laughs> And you were a musician, a musician yourself. Yeah, I played drums, mm-hmm. um, and and later bass. You know, just whatever needed to be done, just so that the ba- so the band could function. Um, the biggest band we got Fugazi to come on the Repeater tour. We booked them and an open for them. So that was kind of the our, our biggest band. That was really awesome. Mm-hmm. Did you? Uh, but during punk during that period, there was also kind of a, a, a often type, kind of like a social like um you know political aspect to it were you did, did that part resonate to you at all did, were you thinking politically and socially yeah and somewhat somewhat I, I remember i mean i was more it was more the interpersonal stuff for me this i mean straight edge was big but yeah i went um i remember when rodney king happened one of my one of my buddies was a skinhead named matt and we marched to the police station to get we did you know the big march to the police station mm-hmm when Rodney King happened. And I remember him asking a question to the police chief. The police chief came out to talk to us. Um, um, but yeah, though, I wouldn't say we were, we were activists so much. I mean, it was more of a social scene, but yeah. Yeah. Did, um, so when you were playing or at the concerts, do you think you kind of had kind of like some music generated Samadhi at all? You know, kind of like just the, the group mind Samadhi type thing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh for sure and it was it was a purifying kind of experience i mean like you're so frustrated with school and all the stupidity of the world that you see in this it's just this general non you know non-specific um frustration and angst that you that just pours out at the show these very very um visceral physical I won't say violent. I mean, it was actually, um, it, it was aggressive from the out, outside, but it was uh, like the you couldn't fall thing. down. The like, yeah, like you would, you would be dancing. You actually couldn't fall down. Like if you, if you before you hit the floor, someone would, would grab you and, and pull you back up. Um, so it wasn't this like hurting each other kind of anger, but, but at the same time, after playing a show, after dancing at a show, you you just were so cle- cleaned out, just completely cleaned out. Um, but then you have to do it again because it, it doesn't last. Um, yeah. yeah, no, and I've said before that that was when I first got to Sogenji and walked into the uh, the Zendo, like to do to do Taito and, and bow into the Zendo for the, before the first session. I remember bowing into the door and everybody was already sitting there waiting, and that that intensity was familiar from that energy that I felt at hardcore shows, but completely, completely silent, completely still. Um, Yeah, definitely, definitely. What did your parents think about your choice of scene? Were they supportive or were they horrified or? They were just kind of clueless. They're just like, well, that's what kids are doing these days. I don't know. (laughs) know, Did uh, Did you keep kind of a background? um belief in an like a greater being or anything like that through this or would you consider yourself an atheist um no no i remember actually i remember going to church with a girlfriend of mine at that time and and like really liking the sermon like the because i remember the the pre the preacher was talking about like 
you know, there's the problems in the world and with yourself and you, there's a power that you have that you can overcome these problems. And I was like, yeah, yeah, there is a power. But I was thinking it's like, it's, it's from each of us. We have to find the power within ourselves. And then he like took a left turn. He's like, no, that power is in the sky. You know, it's, it's exterior. So even at that time, that was my, uh, my disagreement, mm -hmm. you know. As a teenager, did you have any access to any Eastern spiritual or mysticism reading materials or? Yeah. The only, it, the only Eastern thing. Was, at all? What's that? Was it part of your awareness at all? That a little bit, a little bit in that, um, in the, in the straight edge scene, there was um, <clears throat> the, the Krishna core. There was, there were some Hare Krishna bands, including, uh, you know, Ray, Ray Capo from Youth of Today, who's a, a you know, one of my favorite bands. And uh, actually, I went to see Shelter in St. Louis one time. And Shelter was his Krishna core band that he was in after Youth of Today. And I, I got to, uh, I got to, you know, go out to the van with them and eat the, the Krishna porridge stuff out of like gallon milk jugs with the side cut off. So you hold the handle and, and eat out of them. So I, I read the, the, the Gita and, uh, but, you know, in my infinite 17 year old wisdom, I just, it didn't connect with me then, um, which is not to say anything negative about that tradition, but it just, it didn't click for me, but I did, I did have some exposure to it. And actually my, my dad I was kicked out of my house because my dad found a Krishna fanzine in my room once and thought, you know, I was in a cult and got really uh, you know, hit the roof, but, but I actually wasn't, I wasn't that into it. Was that temporary, the kicked out? Um, he didn't kick me out then. I, I did end up leaving to go live with my brother a, a year or two later. Mm -hmm. Same yeah. town? Uh, yeah, yeah, same town. How about college? Did you ever go to college? Yes, yeah. So that was actually, um, I was going to go to Mizzou. That was when, and then I, I moved out um, and went to Southwest Missouri State uh, for a, a semester because um, I, there was, I was in another band that I didn't want to leave. So I was in that band for you know, another semester and that band fell apart. Uh, so then I went ahead and went to Mizzou, which was where my parents wanted me to go. Mm -hmm. I had no plan at all. I really just wanted to get out of my parents' house. Um, was that tense scene at your parents' house? What's that? Was it just normal teenager parent? Argument? Yeah. Yeah. My parents were great. I have no complaints. I mean, they were really, they were wonderful people. I, I was not really rebelling against them. Mm -hmm. um, it was more the world and at large. Right. Yeah. This is hard being a teenager. Yeah, and I yeah, and I I remember really clearly like being just like I almost couldn't stand it that the world was so beautiful and amazing and at the same time so stupid and like just crushingly absurd and stupid. And I remember because the I inherited my parents' car. I had a '78 Thunderbird. Was my car my first car when I was a teenager? I remember driving around in this huge Thunderbird in the middle of summer in Springfield and it gets super hot and uh, I didn't have air conditioning and I was stopped at a stoplight. You just, you know, you can see the heat just coming up off the pavement and there was some just normal middle-aged woman at the, at the light in the car next to me. Um, and I just was like seized with this. I just couldn't stand it. I like was about to, I wanted to lean out of the wind, lean out of my open window and bang on her window. And I remember just thinking like I had to communicate to her. It doesn't have to be like this. It doesn't have to be like this. And that was just like, I just couldn't stand it. <laughs> there was, um, yeah. And that was really strong for me really early. Uh, and that was a lot, you know, the behind a lot of the, the hardcore stuff. And, and that's what resonated with me about Zen when I discovered it. So, um, being straight edge, does that mean you didn't dabble with psychedelics and stuff? That's right. Yeah, I never did. Um, I was straight edge from when I was like 17 till I was 20, which I still was really fortunate for me because uh, a lot of my friends um, really went heavily into, into some dangerous territory and messed themselves up, at, especially at that age in a lasting way. Um, and I've, I've lost a lot of friends, you know, from that time period, What's like hard drugs, you mean, or, um, yeah. And just hardcore alcoholism and never escaping from it till the point, you know, that it becomes depression and suicide or overdose and, or, uh, yeah, I've, I've several friends I've lost that way from that scene. Um, but 
that didn't last forever. I was, um, I, I sort of figured out that uh, self-righteousness is one of the most um, eh, addictive intoxicant, intoxicants. <laughs> so, um, I, eventually I, I lost. Uh, and also the, the, I was like the only kid in the whole town, I think that was actually straight edge. There were, <laughs> there were some, there was a handful. I was a small town when there were a handful that sort of were, but weren't really. And it was just, I got the, just the whole, I got disillusioned with the whole thing that nobody really cared. It was, it was just about, which is fine. You know, looking back, that's, it's normal and natural for teenagers to just want to hang out. Um, right. Nobody, nobody cared about that crusader stuff. Um, so yeah, then the, then the pendulum sort of swung back the other way after being completely straight edge. It was actually at a, a Murphy's law show. Um, that uh, my my dad was I said my dad was a, a postal carrier so I had his mailman hat mm -hmm. and uh, yeah Murphy's Law did beer bath and you know flooded the whole crowd with beer and I remember my hat stinking like beer for weeks after that um, so yeah right about the time that I went away to college uh, I started drinking so how about psychedelics did you try any no, I never did. So that was, that's, I guess that's what I was getting around to with the story. I, I drank a lot and smoked a great deal of pot, but I sort of still had that straight edge voice in my ear. So I never did psychedelics or, or, or anything harder than pot, but. Any uh, uh, Eastern spirituality in college that you were practiced or had access to or. Well, that was um, or... just the beats that, that was. You know, my next stop once I got away to cut when I went to college, I, I it was an art major for a couple of years, and I switched over to poetry and started reading the beats and uh, very ardently trying to replicate that lifestyle. Um, but yeah, this through, through poetry, that's where I, I started discovering, like, you know, Han Shan and translated by Gary Snyder was a big one, Rio Khan. Um, started reading the haiku poets, and through those you know, started discovering Eastern poetry and Eastern spirituality. When you read those, what was kind of the internal result? Like, like let's say you re read Rio Khan or Han Chan, like, did it invoke anything for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the, uh, there was sort of a defining moment when, you know, I, I was, I was reading, reading the beats, drinking, a lot, just kind of drinking, carousing, mm -hmm. and being really miserable. You know, I was horribly miserable, hurting everyone around me all the time, and I could recognize that. Um, and there was one uh, one night, my uh, my girlfriend at the time was having a house party, and uh, I was supposed to go. Right, of course, it was my girlfriend. I was supposed to go, and I I was reading the the essential haiku which was Basho, Busson, and Issa, translated by Robert Haas. And I was just down in the basement reading this, this book. And, and just the, there was just a quiet and a clarity and a spaciousness in those poems that spoke, you know, this is exactly what I was lacking. This is mm -hmm. what, I, what I absolutely need. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't tear myself away from that book. I, and I, so I skipped that party. Um, and it was a, it turned out to be a, a fiasco. The party they 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 built a bonfire and the police came and my my girlfriend was tripping and I was supposed to be there and I wasn't and uh, that so we broke up from that experience and uh, that but that was I, that was sort of like when I realized I needed to that was what I needed and so that was when I found the the local sitting group in my town and uh, got up the courage to actually walk through the door, which was difficult, but I started. What, what tradition was that? That was in, it was a Rinzai group. That was um, Jane Lago and Jundo, Tim Williams, who were students of Harada Roshi. Oh, really? Yeah. And they had a small sitting group in the Stevens Chapel. Mm -hmm. Stevens is a traditionally girls school just north of Mizzou and just across the street, really. And they had like this non-denominational chapel on campus. And Tim and Jane lived just like a block away. So every Sunday they had sit. So they had like one all day sit a month. Um, um, Do you yeah, remember so what your first impressions of that group was? Um, just, it was very, uh, well, well, what I remember was my impression of, of, of Tim Williams, Jundo, 
was because I, I knew him. He was he was a, a painter. So I knew him through the art school. OK. Um, and he had some classes with some of my roommates. And I, so I had met him before um, and he was just a really amazing guy. He was just really intense and alive and vibrant mm -hmm. in a way that was just spoke to me in a, in a way that like a lot of the kids my age just weren't, you know, they were, he was just more alive than, you know, these kids, 15, 20 years younger than him. Um, the group itself was really bare bones. Like we just, the, the chapel was sort of like this, I don't like a pentagon or hexagon shape but with a hall, hallway all the way around. And we would just, we would take the cushions off the pews and put them on the floor in the hallway. And then there was a big like black garbage bag of Zafus and we would put Zafus down and just sit in the hallway. Um, and I think there was a bell and that, that was it. Um, but uh, yeah, Jindo would, he, he, would took, he would take me painting. Like we would get up before dawn and go climb the bluffs above the Missouri River to, to paint the morning light. Um, uh, just really, really amazing. College. Yeah, that was when I was in college. And uh, how long did you, how long was that? How long did you sit with that group? Mm, probably a couple of years, two or three years. Mm -hmm. And I was really, I was really serious about it. I was really into it. I, like I got the key to the chapel and started like going for a 6 a.m. set. Like I would go and mostly by myself, but we put it on the schedule. So I opened the chapel and sit every morning early there so people could come. Um, did that for a couple of years. There was a, a There was actually, there was an interlude after, because I got, I married my last girlfriend in college. We were married for like less than a year. Um, While in college still. Yeah. Just after we graduated, because okay. we, we were going to go to, we, well, we did go to Europe the summer after we graduated and we decided to go ahead and get married before we left. So backpacking around Europe and we, you know, we only really got together. Um, we were drinking buddies, basically. We were kind of always the last two standing at the end of the night. So that's how we met. Um, and uh, so the, yeah, the backpacking trip to Europe did not go well. <laughs> it's kind of this pressure cooker. <laughs> um, and uh, so that, that fell apart within a year. Uh, she actually went on to marry Frank Black from the Pixies. It's kind of an odd fact, factoid. She's a great, I mean, she's really great. You know, we, we were just kids and it didn't work at that time, but I, we've been in touch since then. She's a, an amazing woman. Mm -hmm. um, so we went to Europe, came back, and she had family in Eugene, Oregon. So we moved together to Eugene, Oregon. And I was, and we, and we split up immediately, like almost immediately once we got there and I got my own apartment. Um, and we got, we didn't even get a divorce. We got a summary dissolution because it was- An annulment essentially. A, yeah, it was less than a year. Um, so I, here I was, I was like working temp jobs that I was making Yakima ski racks in a, in a factory in Eugene, Oregon, and, and sitting with the Eugene Zindo at that time, which was a, a satellite of Dharma rain. Mm -hmm. Soto. Soto. Yeah. And that was, uh, it's Boots Genji now with AJ McMullen, but this was before he was even there. This was, uh, I think it was Getsushin Brock in her house ran the group and, uh, and Gyokoko and, uh, uh, why, why am I blanking? Carlson, what's his name? Oh, yeah, um, Carlson. Uh, I can't remember. That. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's terrible. But they were they would come down and and give talks at the group, and I actually and I would drive up there with people from the Eugene Zendo, and I actually I took Jukai with uh, Gyokoko Carlson, Kyogen, Kyogen, and Gyokoko. That's who it was. Kyogen, yeah. Um, so yeah, I took, I took Jukai with, with Yokoko at that time. And then after our, after our dissolution was final, I, I went back to Missouri and I lived in a friend of mine's garage in, uh, in Eugene or in, in Columbia, back in Columbia, Missouri for one more summer. And that was when, uh, I knew I wanted to go to Eugene, not Eugene, so, uh, Japan, I'm sorry. When, so after, when you, to yeah. back up a little bit, when you um, why did you get um, well actually I, go back further. So when you when when you were practicing um in college and getting into the Zen group, did I imagine you broadened your reading mm -hmm. 
about Zen and started reading like what uh, what books or what teachers kind of resonated with you or what approach to Zen? Um, I remember reading, well, I, uh, Three Pillars was huge. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, I before I even went to the group, I taught myself to sit from the pictures in the back of Three Pillars. Okay. Um, yeah, I remember, I remember like, because I made a stack of t-shirts. I was sitting on t-shirts in my room in the basement. And uh, I remember just, I busted out laughing because it was like the silliest thing I had ever done to fold myself up in this position. But I, I, but I remember really clearly feeling this weird, like once I got into the posture, it felt like my organs were falling into place. Mm -hmm. And I thought how weird and funny that felt. And I always remembered that sensation. Um, but I worked at the library. I, I went through a lot of books, um, everything I could get my hands on. Like, uh, I had to, I interlibrary loaned Hakuin and like photocopied the whole book so I could have a copy to keep. Um, I remember briefly, I was briefly into Alan Watts for, for a bit. Um, and I, uh, soon after reading some of his books, I read a biography of him, which sort of turned me off to him, but there was always something. And uh, it's a funny story. I remember like just gushing to one of my roommates about, you know, look, look at this book just fell into my hands at exactly the right moment. Can you believe how fortunate this is? And, and he was like, man, you work at the library. You see like 3000 books a day. It's not, it's not surprising that you're going to find one that's interesting. Did, um, um, so did you, um, so at first you got into what, what appealed to practice, what appealed about practice to you was a sense of peace and quiet and you know a quiet space mm -hmm. you read those books you were introduced to the idea of kensho presumably did you start, did you think like i want that or you know did you think about awakening or kensho was that did that enter your, your um, kind of approach to it at all not specifically I don't, I don't have a strong memory of like being drawn to that um yeah no i think just like i said i was just suffering mm -hmm. you know the whole college scene was just so like fake and painful mm -hmm. like you're supposed to supposedly if you just have fun everything will be fine but it's mm -hmm. completely untrue mm -hmm. and then like getting a taste of that like i said first of the poetry and then experientially through the sitting that was uh it was just so clear that that was like the remedy um um uh, yeah so so no so Kensho per se was not did not resonate with you. Like um, you. not 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 particularly. No, I don't remember it being like a motivating factor so much. Sure. And then when you uh, so you got um, Jukai and Eugene, what mm -hmm. what motivated that? Was it just a desire to deepen commitment, or was there something yeah. about the precepts? Or yeah, no, just it it just made sense. And I, I remember uh, we had to, it was like, there, yeah, there was a precepts class that we did and you had to go in and do an interview. So I went into the room and, and talked to Gyokoko about it. And I told her, I think I kind of talked about how, you know, I had this strong um, sense of Christianity when I was a kid and then felt really alienated by it. But then now getting back, getting into these teachings, I can kind of, am more sympathetic to that earlier phase and not, you know, less uh, dismissive, you know, like through Buddhism, I was understanding, um, why Christianity appealed to me. Um, and I remember saying, oh, you're an easy one. Just go for it. <laughs> and um, so did you, did you have a, like a Dokusan relationship with that teacher? No, that was like a, that was like a weekend retreat to do the, uh, the Jukai. So you, it wasn't like you had a deep commitment with a teacher and then you wanted to do you guys like anyone could do it regardless of your relationship with the teacher right right like like i said they had come down to eugene was sort of a satellite group of dharma rain and they came down once in a while and, and we drove up for this overnight three you know three i think it was a weekend retreat um where the jukai was given was that kind of a session like experience um yeah yeah that was a session and i remember yeah i remember actually uh domio burke was there and i remember being really impressed because she was so stern like all through session and then like as soon as it was over she was just like laughing and bubbling and i remember being impressed by that it's in the, it was in the building where uh i guess rinzon is now it's a it's a rinzai place now because they dharma rain moved out um the domia Berg, she has a really great podcast I, mean, I know i want to check it out i haven't i haven't had a chance yet but it's very it's very soto um and it's in her outlook obviously she's a soto priest but i mean it's yeah. 
it's a really good, you know, a, you know, a great presentation of the Soto approach, at least the Western Soto approach to uh, to practice. Cool. Um, okay, so you're so you're back in the Midwest, and you're and it, you're starting to get inklings that you want to go to Japan. Yeah. So at this point, you know, the my undergrad had ended, my relationship had ended, and I had to make a choice. I was, you know, I could either go to grads. Sorry. I'm sorry. You got a degree in poetry. Yes. Yeah. I got a, a English, mm-hmm. comma poetry writing of completely unemployable. <laughs> Um, but I was still dragging my feet. Like I was trying to, to not do it. Um, and, uh, the kicker, what, what did it was I, I was, again, I was working temp labor and I was, uh, it was at a, it was at a place that made railroad crossing arms. Mm-hmm. And it was great because there, there was a, one of the things I got to do was assemble the bases and they had these giant, like bolts like six inches across with a big pneumatic drill and you can you're just drilling these giant bolts Uh, but anyway it was a rainy day um and actually it was it was kind of a bizarre coincidence because i was leaving the the railroad yard arm crossing job to go to an interview at kinko's i was trying to get a full-time job at kinko's and it was a rainy day and this lady sideswiped my car and we had to go you know report it and exchange insurance and I'm all flustered. So I go to Kinko's to do the job interview and the interview goes great. But there was this, like you, there was, you had to, on the phone, you had to call in and they asked you this series of questions to determine how honest you were. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I was so like discombobulated by having had this accident. I didn't really catch the instructions and it was like push one for yes, two for maybe three for no, or like it was some, something like that. And I wasn't sure I even had the numbers right. So I just completely blew that test. So I was deemed too dishonest to work at Kinko's. (laughs) And at the same time, from that encounter, the the body damage on my car was so bad that the insurance company declared my car totaled. It was an 85 tempo. So they wrote me a check for $900. So that was my my plane ticket to Japan. And you'd heard of... You heard of the Roshi through your your kind of your first Zen mentor. What was his name again? Uh, Jundo Tim Williams. Yeah, yeah Jundo Tim. And so yeah. he told you about the Roshi, and, and had he lived there in Sogenji? He had visited. Yeah, he had been all around. He'd he'd been in, in India and gone to Sogenji several times. Um, yeah, he was very encouraging. Um, in fact, I remember he was uh, adamant that uh, that the Roshi at any day was going to move to Whidbey Island and would not be at Sogenji anymore. So if I wanted to meet him there I should go there before he's surrounded by hundreds of students on Whidbey Island but that was 1997. Yeah. And um, so how did, did you reach out to Soga G and say like hey I want to come visit or mm-hmm. yep. or whatever or do you call yeah, it? I, I, I did it by email actually I remember Chisan said that I was probably one of the first people in history to do that that uh, request and interview by email. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so I got and also uh, yeah, so I was actually in Springfield when I got when my car got damaged, and then I moved up to uh, Columbia and was practicing in, in, with the group there again, waiting from, you know, I had to buy, it was a few months before my ticket, I bought the ticket, um, and uh, Mitra Bishop came and did a weekend session with the group there in Columbia. Yeah, she's, she's the teacher down in Hidden Valley, is that right? Uh, she's at, uh, no, that's Zuisan's at Hidden Valley, but... Um, uh, Mountain Gate in New Mexico. Oh, okay. There's a residential place in, in New Mexico now. Okay. And she's a student, a longtime student of Harada Roshi's. But oh, she, okay. so she did a, a weekend session with the group in, in Columbia, Missouri. Um, mm-hmm. So she also sort of vouched for me, like, too. How was, uh, was that, did that session feel differently than the, the Soto one? Was that your second session? Um, y- yeah, yeah. It, it didn't feel, I mean, it was because I had done a lot of Jundo's group in Colombia did a lot of day long, like all day sits, like there were like 12 hours, like you would get, you would start at five and it would end at five. So this was just sort of like a, that with an overnight. Um, so it didn't feel so different from that, but yeah, I remember going and, uh, and Mitra got me started on Susa Okukan. She like, you know, demonstrated the, the breathing practice that Harada Roshi starts everyone on. 
And uh, so at this point, what was keeping you going with Zen? Was it purely the promise of what might you might get out of it, or were you starting to see internal changes that that um, kind of motivated you to keep keep cruising? Yeah, both. Absolutely, I was seeing you know real changes. I could, um, yeah, I, I had a, a strong sense that you know something was happening that it was making a difference to me. Um, and uh, and like I said, it just felt right. There was something really right about it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so then it was fall of 1997. I actually, I missed, I missed Halloween. I went over the international dateline and lost Halloween that year and arrived November 1st at, at Sogenji. Mm -hmm. And um, was that a trip going to Japan? Or did you, did you pretty much go straight from the airport to the temple? Oh, no, yeah, I went, I went straight to the temple. I didn't really, and I, I really, I, I, I had no real interest in Japan. I just wanted to go, you know, for the training. But I had never, you know, I, I did the backpacking trip to Europe, but besides that trip, I had never really even been out of Missouri. So it was, <laughs> it was quite an experience. Yeah. Uh, could you paint a little bit of a picture of what it was like showing up at the monastery and what your experiences and impressions were of it? Yeah, well, I remember, um, because you get to go up to the guest house when you arrive to get over, you get a day or so to get over your jet lag. And I remember at that point, the first time I ever saw the, I had never even met Harada Roshi before. And uh, it was a Takohatsu day. So everybody who was not going on Takohatsu lines up alongside when everyone else is lined up for Takohatsu with their hats. And then they all file out and the Roshi kind of sees them off. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a, uh, there was a longtime monk who was kind of troublesome to the Roshi who had just returned, had been gone and, and was back again. And so he arrived at the same time as me. And I remember like, you know, trying, you know, standing there kind of formally, not looking around very much. And, and Harada Roshi just like going off on this guy, okay. <laughs> just like, like tearing, like barking and screaming, you know, just rawr, 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 rawr. And it just like terrifying. Or did the uh, guy understand Japanese? Was that? Was it being translated or did the guy understand Japanese? No, yeah, he's, he spoke Japanese. So he was getting it all in Japanese. Um, it just scared the crap out of me. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know what? You know, what have I got myself into? And then I kind of out of the corner of my eye, I peek over at him. And her Rossi is just like beaming like a little baby, you know, just one second after like ripping into this guy. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of. Uh, sign of what was to come so <laughs> what um what were the what was the most trans transgressions you know i don't I have no idea yeah, yeah. he was uh, yeah I, I won't go into that he was he's a he was a character <laughs> <laughs> um, so but yeah this, so oh go ahead please i just uh i was don't i so i you know i just i lived in the zendo and we you know we slept on the ton and you could you could carry your bed out and sleep anywhere uh, I arrived in November, so I remember the 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 cold started in right away. Um, and I remember, I think it might have been that first Roha, either the first November, the November Osashin, I might or it might have been that December Rohatsu. But I remember, uh, must have been November because I I had never used chopsticks before. <laughs> like we didn't we didn't go out to Asian restaurants, you know, and so. I, I remember like being so cold that my, my fingers were numb and I couldn't use the chopsticks and I was so hungry because we hadn't eaten since like 4.30 the night before. And then finally breakfast is there and, and I couldn't eat. So I remember just being about to burst into tears at the breakfast table because I couldn't, I couldn't get my numb fingers to do the chopsticks properly. Mm -hmm. um, but just, but at the same time, I just, I really loved it, you know, and like, it just resonated with all, like I, like I said, all the way back to those earliest experiences as a kid in the woods behind my parents' house, like with Robin Hood, the nights, this, the, the ferocious energy of hardcore, all of that, like kind of just coalesced and, and it so made like sense. Continuation of all that. Right, right. It made me, you know, to, to, to talk about it, it seems like a weird kind of herky jerky jumping around to different things, but there was this continuous arc through it that, that made perfect sense. Um, and uh, what did you think of the other people? What, did you, uh, did you make friends pretty quickly or did people not really interact or? 
how, how yeah was no that? it was it was great there was and there were several you know youngish guys in the zendo um the men lived together in the zendo and there was there were separate quarters of the women generally the women had rooms that they either i think they usually were doubled up in rooms but um yeah there were there was a lot of camaraderie and it was really i remember just the main topic of conversation was like if you could be eating if you could be eating anything you wanted to be eating right now what would you be eating you know we could just sit around like talking about stuff like that and just sort of but really yeah really great people and then and i remember that because the container of the monastic form and we got up at 4 30 and there was a you know there was osashin every month mm -hmm. so there was a seven day osashin every month that was sandwiched between two co-sessions so there were more session days than non-session days by far there were only like three or four non-session days a month mm -hmm. um and, and yeah, we're you know living in these three hundred year old buildings with no heat, no no air conditioning. So the just dealing with the elements, dealing with the schedule, and uh, and dealing with the roshi. We'd you know seeing the roshi two or three times a day. Um, very demanding, very high pressure. Um, what was your first um, dokusan experience with him like? Um, or earliest? Yeah, I don't really remember. I mean, I remember being sort of terrified, of course, but just exhilarated and uh, early, early, I mean, uh, everybody starts with Sosoku Khan. So Doku-san is just basically him demonstrating the breath and you trying to give your breath. Um, but he's very encouraging, very, yeah, very supportive at first. And I remember uh, after about three months or so, I remember hitting a wall. And being like, I just, you know, the kind of the honeymoon phase where it wore off. And I was just like, man, this, this actually sucks. I mean, this is really, really hard. And I was like, I'm not going to, this is stupid. Why would anybody do this? And I remember like, I was just kind of thinking this to myself. And I remember going into Dokusan to Sanzen. And he just like read my mind. It kind of blew me away. Maybe he was just reading my face, but I, he just said, you, you've come so far. It would be a shame to leave now. Did you like, go there with an open-ended idea of how long you would stay, or were you like, "I'm gonna go there for three months"? Or, yeah, I mean, like, I had you had to commit to a year. Okay, but I I only had a one-way ticket, so um. But yeah, I just I I loved it once I got there. Um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, did did you? So I imagine your experience of Zazen changed as you were living there. Absolutely. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. I mean, what I, with, with Sosoku Khan, you eventually, after like a year, year and a half, it starts cooking and it starts just the bellows of your body start working on their own. Mm -hmm. And I remember really clearly getting to a point where it hit me that, oh, the, uh, really correct posture is actually easier because I was like, you know, I would get so exhausted in session. I would feel like, oh, I'm going to fudge a little bit. I'm so tired. I'll fudge a little bit. And that just made it way, way worse. But mm -hmm. there came a point when, when the, when the Sosoku Khan starts cooking and I, and I just realized that I can let my skeleton support itself, mm -hmm. which, you know, looks like you're trying really hard to have perfect posture, but it's actually way easier. And the more correctly you can sit and just Zazen sets itself. Um, so, and when that happens, when this, uh, the is, Zazen starts doing itself, this energy just comes and you're just kind of buoyed along by that. Um, and that was, so that was amazing. Um, to kind of get to that point. Um, Were you having any kind of deep samadhi experiences or anything like that? Or is it mostly kind of a physical energy type experience? Yeah, you know, it's funny because I, in, in hindsight, I've said this to other people that I, I had some 
I never spoke to the Roshi. Like I like weird stuff would happen and I would never talk about it in Sanzen, which was like my, it, it, you know, in 2020 hindsight, I can see that was my own fear, you know, my own clinging to, to not do that. And, but yeah, weird stuff happened. Like I remember um, like one time the, uh, so for the, the way, the way Hirata Roshi teaches Suzoku Khan, it's a, it's an extended out breath, like to the very, very end of the breath. And then once that breath is completely spent, your body will naturally inhale of its own. So I was riding this breath out to the very end. And it, it just so happened that the, the inhalation came right as the inking struck to end the period. And so I this really clear memory of that, the sound of the inking was the expansion of my belly to inhale in the in a physical sense of the movement but and also a warmth there was like a glowing warmth in my belly and also a color it was a very bright colorful warm sensation of the sound in my belly um so you know little things like that would happen um another time i remember uh the, everybody got sick. There was some, something was going around the Zeno and everybody got sick and the Jashario had to drop out and go to the guest house. And, and I, so I was recruited to take over Jashario duties that I had never done before. So one of those was like, I think it was during a Sosan, I had to come back and open the Zendo. So I was like standing at the Zendo door waiting for the group to, to file back from Sosan. And I got this strong sense that like something was like pulling my spine up and it was such a weird strong sense i remember like looking around like what was that what is going on and when i looked around i could see that there was there are these tall pine trees in front of the sanmon and it was those trees like there was this without really even being aware that they were there or not directly looking at them they were like i was getting this mirrored posture from those pine trees um So yeah, little little weird weird things like that were going on, and stuff like I remember a lot of it was uh, like I've said whenever I whenever I read Mato's book about the instruction to spread your vision out, mm -hmm. I never got that instruction explicitly, but I remember being in the zendo and like you know looking straight ahead and being able to see when the the jiki jitsu click the lighter to light incense and I saw the flame saw him lighting the incense like just as clearly as if I had turned 90 degrees and was staring straight at it I could see that like out of the periphery of my vision it was so spread out so then years later when I read that instruction I was like oh yeah no nobody specifically told me to do that but that was absolutely happening and I could see the use of that yeah. um I'm curious, this is a little bit of a switch in the direction of the questions, but uh, like, how does the temple survive? You know, does it, is there a local danka that comes for like ceremonies? Like, how, like, cause you guys aren't paying to be there, right? Right. Like, yeah. How, no, how, how does, how's there any inflow of income into the there's, community? there's still, there's still danka families, you know, there's still supportive supporter families that, you know, just kind of tithe mm -hmm. because they always have. Um, the Roshi has a lot of supporters. Um, there were also like the, the Akeda, the Akeda clan still came for funerals. Okay. Um, and I, I don't know all the details, but I, I remember being told that they were sort of a Yakuza family and, and had a lot of funerals for that reason, <laughs> but, but they, they always were coming around for funerals. Um, and we did Takohatsu like every, every few weeks, the group Was went that out. kind of just ritualistic or did you actually get enough to kind of eat? from those um i mean I, I have no idea what the amounts were but yeah we, we got, actually got money and brought it back okay. um, I, I don't think it was huge but we you know we did do that but. did um okay so you so you work how long did you do the uh, breath work before moving on to move or whatever about a well, year and a half of a year and a half yeah uh, how did you present move to you what was the um like what were the instructions um I don't remember there being specific instructions. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was so like chomping at the bit. I was like, I was voice, I was basically voicing my Suso Kukan. I was like screaming. I was started yelling before I was put on Moo. So it was, I was sort oh, of. Oh, in, uh, in Doku-san. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
yeah so because so for like a you know a year and a half we'd just been you would voice you know you would just just enough to hear so he could hear your breath you would demonstrate your breath mm -hmm. and as that it, energetic intensity just sort of started bubbling over i would just vo i started voicing that more and more loudly mm -hmm. um which uh you know at that i don't there's no formula for it but at that time that that was how it was manifesting for me and so that um it was just sort of a continuation of that when i was put on move that was how i was doing move. and um at some point you uh, i remember we talked on the phone once and you mentioned you did this kind of um like solo retreat Can yeah you talk a little bit about that sure yeah i mean like i said the uh just the container of the monastery was amazing. And after a certain amount of time, like I mentioned, when this energy just starts bubbling over of its own, we kind of wanted to do more. And I remember just like wanting to go for it, just wanting to, to try anything I could. And uh, even before the, the doku session, uh, me and a friend of mine, one rohatsu we 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 didn't even talk about it it just sort of happened we just we were sitting yaza in the zendo across from each other mm -hmm. and uh for for rohatsu there you got baito sare in the morning and the leftover baito would be left in this thermal what is that about? What is this? the the umeboshi plum tea okay really astringent bitter tea so we had this little jug of this thermal jug of baito tea and we would we would sit for like an hour or two and get up and pour each other a shot of this baito and and then we would sit some more and we ended up sitting sitting all through the night and then we just we did it again and just sort of this unspoken agreement we 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 sat through the the entirety of that rohatsu without sleeping at all which was honestly it was kind of a waste of a rohatsu because it was we we were just pushing so hard just to do that. It was kind of kind of foolish, and you know, but uh, but having gone through that, then I I realized that you know these stories you read about not lying down are totally possible. That's not made up, um, and so I could see how that that was possible. And so um, to to not sleep at all is stupid. Like the real, the only res, real result of that was that my head felt like a basketball by day seven of Osashin. It was just weird, weird feeling. Um, but keeping that energy going and and not laying down then made sense. So we, so for about, I guess about three months after that, I I didn't lay down at all for sleeping. I would just like prop prop myself up and sleep that way. Um, and after a few months, I started getting like a pain in my back and, and stopped doing it every night. But, that, but I continued to do that for Oseshin until I left. Um, and nobody was like making us do that. You know, it's not like that was enforced or, or you know, nobody was standing over me with a stick making me do that. But we, there was that kind of energy and that kind of uh, going for it attitude. Um, so that was kind of what was behind the doku sessions when people would ask the Roshi if they could, you know, go up to the mountainside by themselves and, and do that. Um, so that was what I did. Um, uh, one summer, um, because I had, I had been NG to the retired abbot and there was one, one term when I was not NG, I was the Dacharyo's helper. So I knew I had a little bit of the sort retired of, abbot was this, um, um, uh, Kansei san. Okay. Yeah. It, which is just his title, which means retired leisure or something. His, his, okay. his name was Yokoin Ippo. Okay. Um, yeah. Amazing. There's so many stories about him too. Can you tell us one? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Like <laughs> I could spend the rest of the time talking about him. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he was, um, he was 94 when I met him there um he was a friend of yamada mumon roshi's mm -hmm. and he took over sogenji in the 50s and pretty much ran it did the upkeep more or less by himself for about 30 years so that sogenji exists at all is due to him when you know harada roshi came in, in the 80s um so then he retired when harada roshi came 
Um, he was a child monk from age eight. He was actually, yeah, he was born in Korea at, you know, and, and when Korea was part of the Japanese empire at that time. Um, so yeah, he was given to the temple when he was eight years old, trained at Myo Shinji. Um, and the, the way I got, uh, to be his NG was the, the previous NG got kicked out because it was kind of a funny story that, um, so we were at, everybody was lined up at the breakfast table and breakfast had ended and somebody comes up, the Roshi was at the head of the table and somebody comes up and whispers in his ear and he like gets up and walks down the table and he motions for me to come. He's like, so I'm like, oh no, am I in trouble? What's going on? So I, I followed him into Kanze san's house and it was just chaos. Like Kanze san was screaming and yelling and the Roshi was like running around and what had happened was the, the NG had, uh, he had been cleaning the toilet with toilet paper and not a rag. And not only that, he didn't even have a rag in the bathroom for cleaning. And so Kanze san figured this out and just hit the ceiling. And so I'm standing and so, but, and this was just, this was like the straw that broke the camel's back. I'm sure there was other stuff that was going on. Um, but he was out. Um, and as I was standing there, I had, I had brought my head towel because we, you know, we, we wore these Japanese white Japanese head hand towels on our heads. And so I had my, I was standing there holding my, my head towel in my hand and I, and I set it down. At this point? What's that? Were you ordained at this point? No, no, this was before that. Okay. Yeah. But I, I, uh, I folded up my head towel and put it down on, on a little stool next to me as I was waiting at the door to see what was going to happen. And Kanze san walked through and saw my head towel and he's like, Are you like, because he was looking for rags. And he's like, There's one. And so I, I took the rag and to protect it, I like put it up on top of my head. And I said, You know, in my terrible Japanese, I was like, This is my head towel. And he just like looked at me and busted out laughing. So. He thought, you know, so that, that was my in. Uh, but the, uh, the former NG like stayed on to train, to train me up, to get me up to speed. Um, another thing, another story that happened around that time was uh, there was, you've, you've heard of uh, Daiko, the, the Danish guy. He's, he's really big. He's like a huge Viking and he actually used to split wood for a living a big, big burly guy. And it, the, the Keisaku rotation and the Zendo was such that, um, you know, there were only a certain number of people that were trained to use the say Keisaku and they each period had a different person carrying the Keisaku. So it was sort of a schedule and the schedule for this one session was working out that Daiko was the first this, Keisaku. Is this the Daiko that went to California? Huh? Is this the Daiko that moved to California or is this a different person? Mm. He he helped build the buildings on Whidbey, but he's back in in Denmark now. Okay, different person. Yeah, there must be a different one. Um, so he was always the Keisaku that first period after Sanzen, um, and this was it when I was like just running every time I was running to be first in Sanzen. So I was always one of the ver one of the first people to come back to the Zendo. Hmm. So empty Zen empty Zendo, Sanzen's done. I come back, and Daiko is waiting there with the Keisaku. So I, every time I would just start, I would go back and start falling asleep and he would come over and just hammer me with the Keisaku. And so I remember relating this to the other NG just because just, just it was weird because like every single morning it was always Daiko and I was always falling asleep and he was always getting creamed with the Keisaku. So this guy thought that was hilarious and he spoke really, really good Japanese. So he told the story to Kanze-san. He was like, ha, 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 you know, Real sounds scared to, scared to go back to the Zendo because he gets hit by the Kaisaku. And, but uh, Kanze san did not think it was funny. So he, uh, he talked to the Roshi and told Harada Roshi that he wanted to have his daily cleaning done before breakfast. So, in order to do that, I had to cut in the Sanzen line. And then instead of going back to the Zendo, I would go back to his house and do his daily cleaning in that time period mm -hmm. before, before the breakfast bell. So, just you know, amazingly kind in that way. Um, what, <clears throat> was there something about his demeanor that was, I mean, was he kind of a living embodiment of Dharma, would you say? Like, did you learn anything from just 
yeah. through osmosis by just hanging around with him. Absolutely. He, I mean, he was a tank. He was just a pure tank. I mean, he was just such a presence and he would, you know, he could barely walk. He would get up, but he would just like rumble along. Um, and really human, just really, like I said, really, really sharp and fierce. Like he would say something and you got, if he had to say something three times, you were done. I mean, he would say it once, twice, you better get it. If he said it a third time, he was just, he would explode. <laughs> so it was kind of high pressure in that way. And he would like, like for cleaning, I remember he, one time I was at a sare and I looked up at a, one of his picture frames and there was a little crumpled up tissue that he had put on top of a picture frame to make sure that I was dusting the tops of the picture frames and I had missed it, but I saw it at that sare. I was like, oh man, <laughs> you know, so really, really sharp, but also really just amazingly kind and human. Mm -hmm. um, he would uh, like, he would tell people to, to take a nap. Like, like I would check in with him after lunch to see if there's anything he wanted me to do. And he would like say, just laid, which meant lay down on the tatami right here and go to sleep. So you, you had to do it. So you would just lay there on the tatami and it was, it was easy to fall asleep at any time. And he would, once he thought you were asleep, he would, he would get up from his chair and get a blanket and like creep over and, and drape a blanket over you too. You know, and he, he loved, uh, sumo you know he he watched sumo on tv and colombo he really loved colombo hmm. but just you know a really really real human human guy but um amazing um so the doku session can you talk a little bit about that sure sure um yeah the at that time they had just built a hermitage so there was this pagoda that was up on the mountainside um and so somebody else was already in Doku Seshin in the, in the hermitage that was built just for that purpose. But I got permission to start in the pagoda. Um, and I remember just being so like electrified to get to do this. Like on the first night, like I couldn't, I literally could not sit. I couldn't, I couldn't sit still. So I remember doing like, I thought I was going to do 108, but I started, I was just doing prostrations because it's a very small space in the pagoda um, and I couldn't sit still to sit. So I just did prostrations that first night. Um, but yeah, just amazing, amazing experience and really, really, really difficult. Um, but I think, so the way it worked out, like I finished a, a, an Oseshin. So then rather than the next morning having a sleep in and a free day, I went straight up to the mountain and to continue from that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I remember just like sitting in the pagoda and like just watching the nature, watching, you know, seeing, I remember these little flocks of brown birds would come and I always thought they were just like intentionally hopping on every single branch of a tree. Like they would just flock on a, on a tree and everybody hop on it to make sure each branch got hopped on. Um, there was one time there was some hive of flying ants of some, some, some kind of flying insect that like erupted one morning when I was sitting there and just like this huge plume of flying insects just came out of the ground and like went off into the sky. Um, but the way, the way the doko sessions worked was that, you know, because everybody in the monastery is on such a strict schedule, you knew where everybody was going to be. So you could come down to like um, take a shower. Like when everybody is at breakfast, you can go, to the shower in the guest house and get a quick shower and then you would go down and the the daily cook the daily tenzo would leave a jar of miso soup and a jar of brown rice outside the kitchen door so while everybody's in the meal you 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 sneak around and you you get your rice and you go back up um so that was like logistically how it worked and of course you came to sanzen it wasn't like oh, okay vacation and yeah and if anything he was like doubly more severe and demanding with anyone who was on doko session so yeah it was not like all relaxing and watching nature <laughs> um but it, yeah it was extremely difficult and i remember just like having to uh go for long walks and, and runs just through the mountains just to to keep moving mm -hmm. you eventually yeah. kind of had what you described to me as kind of disillusionment with the kind of Something yeah like can you talk about that a little bit sure i'll try it was uh 
what happened was um, it ended up being a long time because I, I was not, it, there wasn't like a clear how long it was going to be. And like we would go like another session would start a, maybe a co-session and I would go and say, you know, at the end of that co-session, co it was like, oh, you can go a little longer. You're doing great. So we go a little longer and it ended up being like eight weeks altogether when I finally ended. But I was, it wasn't clear to me that it was ending. I didn't really know that that was like the end of it. And uh, that final night, I remember um, sitting Yaza and getting this, uh, it was like I was sitting at the bottom of the ocean, like this incredibly heavy weight holding me down. Um, and I could not move at all. And I remember, but, but I was kind of aware of it that I aware of not being able to move. Um, and it lasted quite a while. And I, the only way I know it lasted some time was that I remember sit, when I sat down to Yaza, the moon was over here. And then when I could move again, it was across the sky, like the moon had, had moved. Um, and I remember that being really, really terrifying. Like it, it, I was sort of hyperventilating after that happened and just, um, really, really scary. I mean, it wasn't like, it was sort of, you know, the void. It was like seeing, it was scary. It was very scary and uh, just raw. Um, and I remember going back, going to, to Sanzen that morning um, and uh, not really knowing what was going on. Um, and that, that Chisan was telling me, you know, you're, you're done. You have to, you know, go, go back up. Today's the free day, go back up and get your stuff. You're, you're done. And I was like, I just, I couldn't even figure out what she was talking about. I was like, you know, it just didn't make sense. Um, but it wasn't, so it was messy. You know, it wasn't like a, it felt negative to me. It felt, it felt um, scary. Um, but so after that, it, it was, it wasn't immediately then, but some, sometime not too long after that, then Haroda she moved me on from Mu. I started doing checking questions and uh, you know, I can see it in, again, in hindsight, 2020, it, I was self-diagnosing and uh, I couldn't accept that. And it, to me, to me then at that time, it felt like he, it was like, Oh, this, this carrot is not getting the donkey to move anymore. So we'll try a different carrot. Like from my perspective, I had completely given up. Like I felt like, done like I was just so done after that doka session um and then yeah, so the, so the, yeah um, yeah I mean maybe there was just because something was resolved and so there you didn't have like the drive to something like that I mean I can I can try to in hindsight like you know 20 years later re-diagnose but yeah something like that and uh so even but and, and i know like he doesn't do that you know i mean there he keeps people on move for like 30 years he doesn't just move you off of move arbitrarily um so i have to accept that from his standpoint that was enough of a glimpse to to keep to move on um but it's taken many many years and a lot of encouragement from other people to for me to be able to accept that 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 you know there was something positive about that <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's been part of my process of, of, did, were you ordained at this point? Like when did you get ordained? Yeah, that was, uh, I was ordained before the doko session. And, uh, um, w w was there a lot of preparation to that or was it just kind of, okay, this next thing I do, I mean, was it emotionally meaningful to you or was it just kind of another thing you did or? Yeah, it, no, it was both it was it was very meaningful um that was the i got ordained between because in at sogenji there's a there's a rohatsu and then a few days later there's a second session so every december there are two sessions hmm. two o sessions so i got ordained between the two o sessions after rohatsu in 1999 hmm. but um i will say there was not a lot of uh you know i talked I talked to a couple people about it, but there wasn't a great deal of 
beforehand, like explaining the implications. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really, I don't think I really fully grasped what I was, what I was in for. Um, but at the same time, it just, yeah, it was felt like something I needed to do. Um, and uh, yeah, I still, I remember there was a, I had gotten a, a CD on, cause on free days you could go into town and there was a, a little specialty store that had uh, a lot of hardcore. And there was a band I liked called Downset, but it's still like, um, and the album I got then had a song called 2000. And I still remember this was like what I was listening to leading at that time period on free days. I had a little Walkman so I could listen to it. Um, what, how's it go? The, uh, so 2000, it's not ours. This is not ours anymore. Precious souls before my birth gave their lives to change this mess. I know they saw something in the dawn, visions that would never let them rest. To unborn generations, inheritors of multiple chain destruction, to all my relations, I'll do what I can in my situation. So that was like, that was kind of my emotional sense of it. That was what I was carrying into it. Um, so yeah, no, it, it, meant, it meant a lot. So after the kind of the, the opening and moving through Lou, did you stay at Soka G for a while or? About, yeah, about six months or so, I guess. But, but you're, you're, but you're, you'd shifted in your intensity and your desire to be there pretty much right away, right? Yes. Yeah, more or less. I mean, that's how I can, in hind, again, in hindsight, that's how I can kind of make sense of what was going on. But yeah, there was a, there was a big shift and I remember sort of, just like sometimes it felt like I was just coasting like I was just you know the the momiji the maple leaves are beautiful and I can eat persimmons off this old tree and I have friends and we sit and we hang out and we have tea and and there wasn't this like this driving kind of bone breaking intensity that I had brought in the early years and so I felt like it wasn't appropriate you know I felt like I was and you'd been there about three years, right? Yeah, about that. And then yeah. at some point you just decided, this is it, I need to, it's time to leave. Right, right. And then I was um, I, I was getting into a, a relationship with my now wife at that time. We, we met at Sogenji. Um, and so that, that was like a new relationship kind of blooming. Again, part of that um, sense that I had at that time. Um, but we, uh, we sort of made an issue of it, which, you know, in, in hindsight, again, looking back, I can see how, uh, how naive and presumptuous that was of us, but we, you know, we went to the Roshi and said, you know, look, we'd like to have this relationship and, and not be sneaking around, you know, not, you know, not, we want to give it a chance. And, and that was, uh, uh, not acceptable. So that was part that was how we 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 parted at that time we we went we went ahead and left and went back to the states what did you guys do at that point um we uh we landed back in portland she my my wife's dad was in portland um and we had like a few hundred dollars between us so we just went back and she had not done her undergrad yet so she went back to to school for undergrad and uh, i uh, i got a job as a cna in a nursing home in got a bike and was like riding around Portland and eventually we got an apartment. We actually, we rented a room with a, with a, a guy from Dharma rain. So Tetsu was, had a new house. Did you, uh, do you maintain your practice at all or did that kind of fall off? Um, no, I did. You know, I, I tried to, you know, I sat a little bit, but uh, there was like, you know, obviously kind of pulling back. It was a difficult, difficult transition. Um, so we were, we were in Portland for about a year. Um, yeah, I didn't really set much then. Um, but I got into Irish music. We lived like two blocks from a, an Irish pub on Alberta Street. So I learned Irish banjo. We went and played sessions there all the time. Um, but then my wife transferred to U of O and we moved down to Eugene. And that's when I got reconnected with the Eugene Zendo. And by this time, AJ McMullen had had come back or had come from, he had been training in Japan, living in Japan, and he came and took over that temple. So it just so happened that the, the graduate student housing where my wife and I 
lived was like three blocks from the temple there. And that's Renzai, right? No, they're Soto. Oh, they're Soto. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, was that a trip going from the from Renzai to Soto or did it kind of just feel like all the same to you? No, it was great. Um, it didn't feel the same. It was obviously quite different. Um, but like I said, like we had about a year in Portland when I just really stepped back. Um, but of course, you know, really missed it and really needed to be doing something. And then just coincidentally living so close to the, uh, to the temple. And I remember like they had some, it was maybe some kind of an installation. It was some kind of an, there was some big event at the temple and a couple of people I knew were, were going to be there. So I thought, oh, I should go say hi. So I went and said, said hi. And they were all so great and welcoming. So that kind of sucked me in. And I ended up just doing their full schedule. He had, a, you know, like 5 a.m. to 7.30 every, every day, Zazen through break, cleaning and breakfast. So I did that every day and, you know, classes a few, few nights a week and every, every now and then a weekend session. Hmm. But no, I think in the, in the broad picture, that was a really important um, experience for me because it was, you know, I had this really, really intense, deep experience at Sogenji, but what what happened? What I saw at Butsugenji and Eugene was it was very low key, very um, it was just a, a neighborhood temple. But Ajo was like a fully functional priest. Like I had never really seen a priest functioning. What do you, you mean? By that? He like you know he did. Obviously, he led zazen. He did you know training for everyone, but he you know, gave talks but he ran classes like he did. That's where I got any basic Buddhism that I learned was, was through him. Like I hadn't really studied that stuff at all. Um, and it was a little embarrassing when I got back cause I was, you know, I'd spent all this time at a monastery and knew very little about actually Buddhism. So that like he did a explain the Butsudan, like he, how to set up a Butsudan class. And uh, even, and then, he even came to my house and did an eye-opening ceremony on my Butsudan, um, which has meant a lot. I mean, I've still, every time I move, I, I, have, the, I have to get that, that image out and put it up because, you know, of the ceremony. <laughs> um, he did, you know, atone, there was atonement ceremonies once a month. Um, there was a, a big daisegake around Halloween, a big feeding the hungry ghost ceremony so that that kind of like ceremonial stuff and need to you know obviously to ran jukais and um so yeah it was very traditional in that sense um and then uh you guys moved is your wife she's a doctor if, if I, if I remember that correct she's a professor yeah i mean she's a doctor but she's a, a a professor and a researcher i don't know why i thought doctor but um so you guys moved to the east coast right here in now. Uh, we, we moved all around. I mean, after, after Eugene, we actually went back to Japan. We went to Nagoya for a year. She got oh. a, a Mambusho scholarship to study mm -hmm. um, philosophy at Nanzan. Mm -hmm. So she studied Kyoto School of Philosophy at, at Nanzan for a year. And I did, Nanzan I taught G, English. The temple? Huh? Nanzan G, the temple? No, Nanzan University. Oh, okay. Yeah, in, in Nagoya. Uh -huh. did, you, uh, did you practice in there in Japan when you were back? Not really. I mean, I, I, I tried, I went to a couple of little like Zazen Kai things, um, but it did. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't click. I had planned to, but then once I got there, the reality of it was no, I didn't. Did you guys get to go visit Sogenji again while you're in Japan? No, nah, no, nah, I didn't go. I didn't go. I should have, but I didn't. Um, was there some sense of like failure and you didn't want to. Oh yeah. Like you're kind of embarrassed to show up type of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. For years, for a lot, it took a long, long, long time to, like I carried that for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I just taught English, so it was really weird. I was this was like modern Japan after having been, you know, in medieval Japan in the in the temple. Mm -hmm. um, so we were there. That was two thousand six. Then after that, we moved to uh, Chicago, mm -hmm. and my wife did her her grad school at DePaul in Chicago. Um, and I was still like, I I practiced with uh, I practiced with Tigan Dan Layton. In mm -hmm. Chicago, a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I can see. Tried like a Theravadan place. Sorry. I can see his book right there. Oh no, uh, kidding! Yeah. It's extensive record. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I practiced with him a little bit. I tried like a Theravadan place, and I also um, that was where I first met Mado, because mm -hmm. 
um, I did Aikido at his dojo in at oh. Shenzhen Kai for about a year. Did you know he was a Zen practitioner? Yeah, I mean, I knew I I went to it was Dayu Zenji, so I, I went to some sittings with them, and I remember uh, loving to get because they did all the same chanting, the Tedai Denpo, and everything was the same, mm -hmm. and that really appealed to me. But it was still too early; like I just I couldn't bring myself to. Like I was drawn, like I was being, I was being drawn in, but I was still like so hesitant to, to get involved again. Mm -hmm. um, and Mado had just started teaching mm -hmm. at that point. But I remember, yeah, there was one sit I went to where he called like a special sons and that anybody who was even people who weren't a student could go. And I thought, man, I really should go, but I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. So, um, but also at that time, that was when Korinji was very, very first getting going. And uh, there was a work party like a, a bunch of the Aikido students were going to go on an overnight camping trip to the land to help like clearing, clearing the area that would be become the Zendo. Mm -hmm. And I signed up to do that. And I actually bought a tent and I was going to go to that work party, but my wife got sick that weekend and I, I had to cancel. And I couldn't go. Um, and then I kind of fell away from after a year. Or so I quit going. Yeah. And then you, then you guys eventually ended up in Pittsburgh. Um, what and so now you're so since then you've started iron city rinzai mm -hmm. and it sounds like you're an official student of Mado. right yeah so how, what how, what was that transition like how did you go from kind of detached from zen to kind of like sounds like you're kind of you, you're kind of all aboard again like right kind of yeah so that was about that was about 2008 2009 when i was um doing Aikido, but being hesitant about doing Zen. Um, a few years later, my son was born in 2014. Um, and we started moving. My wife finished her PhD. We moved back to the West Coast. So we were in San Francisco. We actually, we were in Sacramento for about six months. Um, we were up in Seattle. We moved around like five or six times. Um, and that was a really difficult period. Like all the moving, having a young kid, um, it was very difficult. And I, I just knew I had to do something like I had to do some kind of a training to get, keep my head above water. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this was also about the time, actually just before then my, uh, my mentor, Tim Jundo Williams had passed away suddenly. Um, and there was a funeral for him at Tahoma monastery. So I was able to fly out to Tahoma for that funeral. And that was when I first met, um, Corey Ichi and Hess, um, because he had, he had come just after I left. So we didn't overlap at Sogenji and we'd never met until that time. Um, so I struck up a friendship with him and, and this was just about the time he was starting his writing his blog. So he was really supportive and encouraging to me and his writings were very, very helpful um, through those difficult, you know, it really kept me going. Um, so that was kind of maybe the first hook that was pulling me back in. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we moved around. We were in Florida then for about four years, and that was during the pandemic. And it was during that time when uh, Corey started doing his online classes. Mm -hmm. And so I you know, wanted to support what he was doing, was participating in the online classes and got, really got a lot out of it. So again, that was um, really, there was really, it really, brought out the physicality that had been lacking for me. Like I kind of let that drop away from my sitting practice, which had really become kind of dull and stagnant, mm -hmm. but then doing the standing forms and practicing with his group every day really yep. brought, yeah, it really brought that vitality back into my sitting too, mm -hmm. like rekindled that, mm -hmm. um, really, really did a lot for my sitting, um, and you know, life in general. Yeah. He, I mean, he's so good with the energy work. I mean, yeah, yeah. So that was huge. And then also about that time, uh, Corey, the the uh, the Renzi discussion forum needed some help. It was getting bigger and bigger. And Corey suggested that that I could help with that. So I was recruited and became one of the forum moderators. And that was a couple of years ago. Um, and I had been, I had actually contacted Mado be, just before that. I had been reading his books and been really excited about what I was seeing mm -hmm. and hearing. Um, because what I, yeah, it was just obviously because it's a, it's a cousin lineage and what he teaches is extremely similar to what we did at Sogenji. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, 
what I saw in his work, it was that, that really clear, intense, energetic aspect, but also like a, like an appreciation of like Buddhist teaching, like a lot of the same stuff I saw with, with AJ McMullen at Butsu Genji that I appreciated about him. Mm -hmm. It was kind of both of those things mm -hmm. together in what Mado was doing. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to, to support that. Um, and I had, you know, I'd written him and, and said as much that, you know, I want to support what you're doing and I want to keep my own practice going. Um, Did you become so like, a formal student at that point? Of his? No, no, that was, that was several years ago. Uh, that was a couple of years ago. So, but yeah, then I started helping out on the forum, mm -hmm. uh, which was really an, an eye opener. Um, it's been a really great experience. Um, first of all, the, the, the moderator group is hilarious. They're just really fun group to interact with, uh, but I've learned so much and, and really, I feel like I've gotten sort of a sense of just like this broad spectrum, broad picture of like the, uh, the Zen scene. Like there's just so much going on that you would be completely oblivious of otherwise that I was completely oblivious of otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I just, even back in Florida, I, I just had this idea that I, I wanted to do something to support what's happening. And like, I have received so much. I want to be able to give something back. And specifically the, I thought I can do something like what, what Tim Williams and Jane Lago did for me back in Columbia, Missouri, you know, I can, I can start a group and that might be, you know, what sets somebody on the path the way I was from what they did. So that, that's really been my motivation in, in starting the Iron City Renzai group. Um, and uh, you guys kind of, you guys meet in person now once a week. Is that right? Yeah. So since March, so once we got to Pittsburgh, um, things just sort of started falling, falling in place. I mean, I've been sort of building up to it slowly for, wanting to and planning to for years so it's finally all kind of coalescing and yeah we we rented a, a classroom in a community center mm -hmm. in march and we've been doing it every sunday and yeah it's i thought i would be completely alone for like months but there's been at least two or three sometimes five or six people um every sunday all, almost all complete beginners but really sincere really great people how do they find do they, have they found easy the Renzi group or how do people most people learn about it no Actually, I, I put up some paper flyers. I got like one really good guy that way through paper flyers, but meetup has been a lot. Um, I got like at least half my people through meetup and I got on Google maps. A couple of people have said they found it on Google maps. Mm -hmm. um, and I did the, you know, I did a website um, and a Facebook group, but I think as far as finding people, um, not so much through the forum, but. How traditional is your, is your um, practice there? Do you guys do like choka chanting? And, and um, like, what, do you guys do chanting? Do you do prostrations? Is there, or is it just sit, a sitting group? Or we do. I I do a little bit of the Zhang Zhuang. Like we start off about ten minutes doing the standing practice that I learned from Corey, mm -hmm. um, and then we do two twenty-five minute or so. You know, it's flexible because I I end up like talking a lot because every, almost everybody's complete beginner, so I end up. I try to give really detailed instructions the best I can for Zazen and for standing and how they work together. Um, so yeah, I give instructions. We set, uh, sometimes I have to adjust. Sometimes it's like 15, 20 or 25 minutes. So we do two periods with a keen hand in between. And then we, then we do the, the short home chanting um, that the Karenji group has set up. So it's like six or seven minutes of chanting. We do like, you know, all the, all the biggies. Yeah. Do you do the Heart Sutra and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, Heart Sutra. Um, uh, so shai shu, um, great, the Great Light Durrani. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we do, and we do it all in Sino Japanese, and I try to explain that. And I'm, you know, I make I've made up a bunch of little sutra books that they can take home if they want. And we've got the English on the back of the sutra books, and then we we end with three prostrations. So, and, you know, and I and I wear my robes, so it's yeah, I guess it's pretty traditional. Um, like I remember asking one of the, when the people first started coming, I was like, is this too weird? Is this freaking you out? And, and he said, no, I'd, it was pretty clear from the website and the flyer that it would be pretty traditional. And I think people appreciate that. Yeah. Um, Great. And, and then you recently were, you went to Sashin at, um, um, at Corinji. Yes. So you're, and so at this point, you're a formal student of, um, of Medo Roshi, correct? Right. Right. So yeah, that this, that's actually 
this is a good opportunity for me to announce that that like it all became official when I got to go in person. Like I did show Ken oh, with so Mato. Just now it's official. Yeah, just at that session. I mean, I, I did show oh. Ken and became his sons and student. Okay. So that happened, and he also gave me a uh, a certificate recognizing, uh, you know, my Shami ordination at Silgenji, and that I had continued training and recognizing me as a, as a priest, as like a Jushoku, as a temple priest. Mm -hmm. um, and he gave me a, a, a second Dharma name. So it's Kazan, Kazan Genryo at this point. He, he's pretty traditional. There's going to be, there's not going to be any sounds in with him over the phone. Or... No. Yeah. 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 But I'm hoping I can get back for Seshin, um at least once or twice a year. Um, and then he also gave me a, a, a you know, a, a little certificate recognizing the group that were in a, an official affiliate of the Karenji Rinzai Zen community. Great. Um, which, you know, from the beginning, that was my intention. That's why I wanted to, to form the group to help support what was going on mm -hmm. with Karenji, but it's all official now as of, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Oh, cool. I know. Yeah. Great. So kind of sum it up. Um, let's say somebody, I mean, I imagine most people who watch these are already interested in Zen. Otherwise, you're not going to sit through, you know, an hour and a half of right. <laughs> but but you know, if someone did, is kind of newer to Zen and they've kind of made it this far, like what like what, why would someone practice Zen? Like what what would be your what, what what's the point of all this? Oh man, yeah. Um, well, I I guess with a caveat that it's it's not for everybody mm -hmm. by a long shot, um, but if it is for you, if it resonates, especially this, the Renzai flavor, like I've been talking about, it's, uh, if you have to do it, it's available and it's real. Um, that's what I think, you know, I see like, I guess, misunderstandings, like, like, like Renzai is a lot of external pressure. Like you get into something Renzai and it's somebody like making you do something. Mm -hmm. And that's not been my experience at all is that I have to do something. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful that this container exists that allows for that. Um, and it is real. Like you, you can read these stories from hundreds of years ago and they're, they're not making that up. Mm -hmm. These, these people have gone through this and they've passed it down from person to person to person to person. And there are people like I got to meet and, and live see almost every day Kanzei san from essentially you know he was essentially from another century this living person i mean that we're so amazingly fortunate to live in in a time where there are still people who have who are passing this along you know in the in the direct teacher lineage but also in the in the lateral dimension you can you can sit alongside people in session you can you can meet other other students, um, and you can work with teachers who have a direct connection. Uh, it's just so amazing. Mm -hmm. And it, especially today when you know, there, there's such a lack of something real. So uh, that's that would be my pitch. Um, it's interesting. Um, so I've interviewed quite a few people. I mean, I think you're right. They're not all up, but I think you're right. My 33rd interview or something like that. And oh. of course I've talked. I like to talk about Zen, so I've talked to a lot of people about practice over the years. And the one thing I've noticed, I, I think the majority of people, um, you know, they may have had an interest in Buddhism or whatever from books, but it was meeting somebody and seeing their energy and feeling the reality of it. That's what actually gets them into practice. Absolutely. Kind of backs up what you're saying there. Yeah, and that's like I, like I said, that's the way Tim Jundo Williams was for me. It was just like, there's something going on with this guy. Um, so we're, yeah. So if, yeah. if someone wants to um, contact you either for the group or otherwise, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, well, I'm, I mean, I'm on Facebook, uh, so I, you can message me. Then there, there's a ironcityrenzai.org is the website for my group, and you know, there's a there's a contact form. My email is on there. It's just Genrio Jones at Gmail. Um, yeah, I'm around if anybody wants to. Genrio. Uh, you sure, it's not Genrio. Pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 A, lot, a lot of times with this uh, podcast, 
I'll, I'll encounter a word that I've read a thousand times, but it's not on me. I've actually never said this word before. Right, right. It's like, kind of trip over. It's like, is it GIF or is it JIF? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you very, and thank you for doing this. Like I, I, I've loved listening to your podcast. It's been, it's been really great. I'm learning you. a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a wonderful thank day. Thank you. You too.